Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Lord Christ, as we have been hearing your word and as we meditate on it now together, we pray that you will lead us into your holy place in our hearts and our minds, that we will hear wonderful things out of your law and that we will enter into the joy of our master even now. But without you, we can do nothing, Lord. So come among us and give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So we're going to reflect on the gospel. There's a lot going on in there, but I want to start with a very relevant observation. I hear there's a, uh, an American holiday coming up this week. Is that accurate? Normally, I don't pay much attention to that kind of stuff, but uh, this, you know, this is one of the ones you can't, can't avoid. So we need to start there because it's directly relevant to our reading, too. This is a great reading for um, Thanksgiving week. And have, how many of you have ever looked up George Washington's proclamation of a day of Thanksgiving and prayer? Have you ever read that? There's some homework assignments. I got two homework assignments for you now. That's one. Just go Google it. And uh, he, he wrote this. This is one line in his um, proclamation of the first public day of Thanksgiving and prayer. He says, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. Wouldn't you love our government to issue something like that today? Right? Don't let anybody tell you that our nation is not, it was was not a nation of Christians at its founding. Um, And this is such a good reminder that old George gives us here, isn't it? Because sometimes as we go through life, Giving thanks is perhaps not our first thought, yeah? And so this, this is good for us. So George is being a good leader, George Washington, and, and, and telling us our duty to give thanks. And, um, and we need to give thanks to God. Because look at the first, look, look at our gospel reading for today, if you would. Pull out your, your Bible app or your Bible or your bulletin. And we need to state the obvious here, this, who's the rich man with the servants? That's, that represents God, right? And, and who are the servants? We are. So he is God. We are the servants. And look how it starts. A man is going on a journey, called his servants, and entrusted to them his property. Whose property is it? And he entrusted it to his servants, to you and me. And, and this is true of everything, um, our, our world, our stuff, and ourselves. It is all a gift from God, and it's all His. It doesn't, I don't belong to myself. You don't belong to yourself. We belong to God. We are His. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven, and the heaven of heavens, and the earth with all that is in it. That's pretty comprehensive. Psalm 50, verse 12, one of my favorites. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. It's all his, and he has entrusted his things to us. And so just take a moment and think of all the Father's things that He has entrusted to you. All that He's put into your care, including your, in your life. Right? The blood flowing through your veins. Little synapses firing in your brain, some more than others. <laughs> you know, and, and all the things we enjoy. All the things He's given you. And we just need to be grateful, don't we? And we've been given so many good gifts, right? It's really helpful to remember what we pray every time we say morning and evening prayer. Some of you have this prayer memorized. Um, There's a prayer at the end of it called the general thanksgiving. And here's how it starts. This is the conclusion of our worship, which is gratitude when we're doing morning and evening prayer. It says, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, 
give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for the immeasurable for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. That covers it all, doesn't it? It's a very complete prayer. It's a very humble prayer. Acknowledge that in and of ourselves we deserve nothing. We're just unworthy servants of God's. But yet then it acknowledges God's goodness and loving kindness to us in spite of our unworthiness. And, and then it's, you know, it's, it acknowledges that you know, in spite of it all, it's just good that we even exist. We thank Him for our creation, the fact that He made us. It's better to exist than not to exist. I'm mean, grateful we're even here. And then we, cre- we thank Him for our preservation, that is, Him keeping us going with the ongoing gift of life. And, and, and you know, all the biological processes involved in that and food and, and safety and protection and all this. And, and then in all the blessings of this life, it goes on to thank him for. That's, that's everything else, right? Family, friends, work, homes, your talents and gifts, all the things you can do, right? A clear mind and, you know, and all this, you, all of it. I mean, and he's been so generous to us, hasn't he? I mean, those of us, that, some of us are going through a hard time right now, whether it's financially or with our health or whatever, we need to stop for a moment, we need to pause and count our blessings, name them one by one, and just be grateful. And, when he, and then it goes on with the gospel, right? But above all, above all these things, we thank you, I love this, for your immeasurable love, love that cannot be measured, immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And then it wraps it up with giving thanks for um, the things that sustain us in our faith. This is for the means of grace. That means for the church, for the ministry of the word and the sacrament and the gathering of the saints. Give them thanks for that. And finally, for the hope of everlasting life and his kingdom. We touched on that last week with the resurrection of the dead. And there's just the beginning of the wonderful things he has for us. Um, That's everything, isn't it? That's the whole package. And our primary posture is to be gratitude. Thanksgiving, gratitude, is the foundation, heart, posture of the Christian. It's gratitude. Being mindful of the grace of God just pouring out on us. You know, this is our heart simply responding to the initiative that God has taken in in making us and preserving us and and giving us the gospel and all these things. And blessing is just, again, grace upon grace. I mean, Think of the generosity and blessings of God poured out on a sinful and rebellious people. I mean, how he loves us, huh? And our gratitude, you know, once we begin to engage this and think about all he's given, not, not what we wish could be, but just be grateful for the reality of our lives currently. Right? And this, this begins to produce in us such profound and endless love for God as we think that his blessings for us in Christ and our creation have no end. It's just mercy upon mercy and gift upon gift. The more you think about that, the more it starts to well up in your heart, just gratitude piling on top of gratitude and on top of gratitude when we're thinking rightly. And, and, it, and it is so, so foundational to the genuine Christian life, gratitude, thanksgiving, that I want to say, um, really, there, there, there should be no such thing as an ungrateful Christian. They don't go together in gratitude and Christianity. They're like oil and water. They just don't, it doesn't make any sense. If Christ has redeemed you and you know he's created you, 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 you are grateful to him and, and you love him. And you might need a prompt and a reminder once in a while. We all get sort of distracted and down in the dumps, but someone who knows the grace of God, you don't have to dig very far, but we can find it welling up within you. Just gratitude. And so. This is, there's a challenging reality here, as we already said in that first line in that, that story. You know, the man was going on a journey, and he called his servants and entrusted to them his.
property. Whose property? His property. All these things are given to us, but ultimately, it's His. Even my very life is on loan to me from God. Every blessing of my life He's given to sustain. And, you know, and, and as I said earlier, we don't even belong to us. You don't belong to yourself. I don't belong to myself. We belong to Him. And so, this is the question this parable puts before us. All these things that are God's property... How do we use them? How do we spend the duration of our lives, our, our, our time, our energy, our resources, our gifts and talents? Uh, to whose benefit are we living these things? You know, to whose glory? How are we spending our lives in the light of the fact that everything belongs to God? As I've been saying recently, one of my jobs is to sometimes say obvious things, to remind you of things you must not forget. And I think it's fairly obvious, but needs to be said on a regular basis, that the things of God ought to be used for the purposes of God. The things of your life, the things of my life, my very life itself, your very life itself, are meant to be used according to the purposes of God, that is, according to the will of God. Not my will, but His, right? That's a loaded statement, isn't it? If you really think about the universality of it, it's freighted with meaning and with challenges. And so that's what this parable is about. Let's start with the good examples. So this rich man, who, who sort of stands in for God in a way, um, he, he's very wealthy, a talent, so it's five, two, and you know, one talent that we're given out. Doesn't sound like that much money until you realize that one talent is equivalent to 20 years wages for a laborer. It's a lot of money. 20 years, so one talent. So these servants get 100 years worth of wages for the first guy. The, the second guy gets 40 years worth of wages. That's a whole career, a whole lifetime of, of someone laboring. And then the, the, the third guy gets one talent, which is 20 years worth of very meaningful sum of money. And it's worth noting, too, he gave them according to the ability of each. He knew these employees of his, these servants, these bond servants, and he knew how industrious they were and how much initiative they'd taken in years past and all that. And so he gives them the resources accordingly. But he gives to everybody something. Everybody, each one of these servants gets something. And, and the expectation is clear, isn't it? He, he's not giving them the money to sort of sit on. This is part of the household wealth. And he's, it's sort of a trial run for these, for these guys. And so they're meant to be investing it. They're, they're meant to put these resources to work for the benefit of the master's estate. And no doubt, there would have been a reasonable expectation for some kind of bonus for them and blessing for them as well, right? As they're, they're proving their resourcefulness and their, their trustworthiness. Um, and so, the first two get to work exactly according to the master's wishes. They just get right to it, don't they? The, the guys who see the five and the two talents, they, they apply the gift he gave for the reason he gave it. And then they get a very rich return. How many of you would like to have 100% return on your investments, huh? So they did a really great job. And they really turned it around, you know. And they double the money, and, and so they, they get a serious promotion. And they get this wonderful greeting that ought to sort of move the heart of every Christian that hears it. Well done. This is what we want to hear when we cross over the other side, isn't it? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. As a young man, um, I remember hearing those words, enter into the joy of your master. I'm like, that's what I want. I want to hear that. Just that invitation, just come in. Come into my joy. I mean, think of how rich this guy is. What it would be like to be in his house. Um, if you've been faithful over a little, a hundred years worth of wages sounds like a lot. But in this, this man, he's so rich that that's just a little. 
This is the little token of the total riches of this man. And so the implication is clear here. Um, there are degrees of honor in heaven and greater responsibility in the new creation. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we just want to get there, okay? And, you know, Psalm 84.10, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness, right? I just want to get there. And, and, and whatever your station in life is, or whatever your lot is, when you get there, you won't care about what you got compared to what somebody else got. You're just going to be glad to be there, okay? It's really about getting there, but at the same time, we have to remember that we will also be busy in the heaven and the new earth, reigning with Jesus. If you've been a Revelation class with me, you've been thinking about this, reigning with Jesus. What does that mean? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? We're going to sit as like administrators and magistrates, officials over the world. What did that le- exactly that looks like? I'm not sure. But Paul gives us a clue here. He says, the world is to be judged by you. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? And in Luke 16, Jesus is clear. Those who have been faithful in very little will be given greater responsibility in the world to come. And so the thought of receiving this greeting and having this hope of if ever more ways of blessing and serving the name of God in the life to come ought to fill our hearts with joy and motivate us even in this life to attempt and do great things for God using the gifts he has given us. Well done. Because this is what we want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So what we see in these first two servants is how the grateful heart acts. Someone who knows their master, who knows their king, who knows their Lord, and then acts accordingly, right? Using the master's goods according to the master's will. All of our resources and our energies and our gifts and our talents, our very lives themselves, leveraging it all for the glory of God, living life to the glory of God, and primarily in spreading the gospel and bringing other people with us into his riches. This is why we were made. This is why you were created. This is why you're here on the earth. In addition to spreading the gospel, for the gospel's sake, we also are to perform acts of of kindness and and mercy and and generosity. Having compassion on others because he had compassion on us. And for his constant pity and compassion for us, um, it just keeps going on and on, mercy after mercy and grace after grace. This, this should motivate us when receiving it and thinking rightly to working hard and sacrificially for the betterment of others, starting at home with your spouse or the other people you live with, right? With, um, in, in child rearing and working with the grandkids and the great-grandkids or whatever and, and, and at work and, and on errands and on and on it goes. Every aspect of our lives, if we're truly living out of the gratitude of our hearts, every aspect of our lives should be conditioned by thanksgiving. Every single bit of it. And that's what these guys, these first two servants show us. Now let's look at the, uh, the guy who was given the one talent and he's, he's a warning for us is a challenge the first thing I noticed here is that he really thinks ill of his master doesn't he the other two didn't have a problem with him did it with the master they they knew him they trusted him they knew what to do they got to it no big deal and they got the reward and and everything was wonderful Um, but he, he says you know I knew you were a hard man and he accuses of, of uh, unjust income. He says, you, you sow where you don't reap. I mean, I'm sorry, you reap where you don't sow. You know, he, he, it's, like, it's like he got unjust gain. And it's implying that this, this master didn't even deserve his wealth. And so this is why he lives, he doesn't know the master. And so he lives in fear of his master's wrath. The other two servants were joyful and eager and trusting of the master. And they had his good and his reputation at heart and they acted accordingly. 
Um, because primarily, I think, they knew that he had their good at heart. And so there's this relationship of faith and trust. And they poured out their lives accordingly, knowing that they rested secure in his house. This third servant shows he doesn't really know the master at all. And so he's afraid of him. And, and this turns his focus not on the master and on the good of the house and everybody else, but on little old him. His attention and his heart was on himself. And, and just his focus being not on the master, but on himself made his life small and selfish and very restricted. This guy had a very small world, this third servant. And, and thinking only of his own skin, only of, of his own safety, he buries that significant investment that was given into his care and trust, and, and he sits on it. And in the end, he's like, I don't want anything to do with this here. You have it back because I, I don't trust you and I don't know you and I don't care about you. That's what he's doing. And here's the lesson for us. If we're tempted to be like him, and I think we all are at times, God has not given you and me all the many and profound blessings of our lives just so we can sit on them and enjoy them for ourselves. Clinging to them and, and, and clutching them and jealously guarding them as if they were given for our benefit and our security alone. When we use someone else's goods for our own purposes and our own sense of security, not trusting in Him, but trusting in the goods He's given us, we're actually squandering them because they belong to someone else. And they were given for his sake and ultimately not for ours. So it's a tough sentence here at the beginning. A man is going on a journey and he called his servants and entrusted to them his property. You know, this man thought he was doing the sensible and prudent thing. He thought he was saving his own skin, didn't he? He's acting out of a sense of self-protection and fear. Um, but actually, the result was the opposite, wasn't it? Reminds me of something else Jesus said. If anyone wants to keep his life, right, he'll lose it. But him who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, I've got to say at this point, this is not about getting into heaven by our works. This is not earning your way into heaven by your performance. So we don't get into heaven by works, but it must be said, neither do we get to go in without good works. What do I mean by that? Well, that's because the regenerated heart acts differently than one that isn't. The one who was made a new creation in Christ acts differently than those who are still an old creation. If God has changed you, if God's grace has come to you, if he's given you a new heart and a new mind, and he's conforming you to his image, what will come out of you eventually is some good works. You will do things for the glory of God and simply for the love of God. These, the, the things that we do into, out of worship and gratitude for God are proof of the work that he has done in us. This is a necessary correlation. Because knowing the master, knowing his true nature, knowing his love and his fairness and his generosity and all this, it produces trust in our hearts, produces love within us, gratitude, right? And so then we're motivated to use his goods in his way to his great glory and for the benefit of his house. And also looking forward to our future blessing. So the good things that we do out of gratitude and worship to God, not to earn his trust, but the things we do because we have his life in us, right? You know, even though, even though these things that we do for his glory are, are, are clumsy and inconsistent and imperfect, 
You know, it's like the crayon drawings. You know, I did this great thing for God. God takes the little crayon drawing that we scribbled and he puts it on the fridge. It's not a Monet. He's not blessed by your art, by your deeds. He is blessed by your heart that wants to give. Look what I did. I love you. That is Christian good works. Born out of just gratitude and worship. And these are evidence that his work has been going on inside of us. So, you know, he sees, and the things that we do, he sees our love for him and, and our desire for his glory, even in our feeble and humble and childish efforts, and he's pleased by the heart that wants to give, the heart that is seeking to glorify him. But now this sort of brings in a challenge um, for us, another one, because we've got to turn the corner here and, and realize that, man, those, those first two servants... They, they doubled the money, didn't they? It was 100% profit on that investment. None of us are able to get in this life a proper return in the gifts God has given us. All of us fall short of even, even at our best days, the best of us, right? To far too great a degree, let's acknowledge the fact that so many of the gifts and talents God has given us, we sort of buried them and we're sitting on them, aren't we? All of us, this is true. It's true of me, and I know it's true of you. So, what do we do? What do we do? What hope is there for us, right? To hear that greeting, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The solution is found in this. In recognizing that there has been only one truly good and faithful servant and trusting in the work that he has done. He is the only one that earned his way into heaven. He kept the law perfectly. Not one millisecond of his life was wasted or squandered. Jesus was, I think he got very little sleep, especially in his ministry. He was constantly in prayer. He's constantly out serving and teaching the people. I think Jesus largely physically survived. (laughs) He wasn't sitting around resting all the time. He was working hard because his father was always working, yeah? And so he came and always worked for us and he did it perfectly. He more than doubled the investment. (laughs) And so our trust has to be in His work, there's been only one good and faithful servant. His name is Jesus Christ. And it is in him that the generosity and the love of God really shows brightest and produces, when we look at Jesus, this is what produces the gratitude and love for God in our hearts, that he loves the world, that he gave his only begotten son, right? And this is the way that God loved the world. And this is the love of God revealed to us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he laid down his life. Didn't even belong to himself. Belonged to his father. He laid it down for the salvation of his people and to the glory of God. And he therein realized the purposes of God and worked to bless his house with inestimable riches and glory. There's a song I want to refer you to. Um, you know, we sing uh, Is He Worthy in here once in a while, right? Andrew Peterson wrote that. And he has a song that this is your second piece of homework. And that is to look this up on YouTube or whatever, or Spotify. Um, Andrew Peterson wrote a song called Well Done, Good and Faithful. And it's not about you, it's about Jesus and his faithfulness and his goodness to us. And it's just a Christ-exalting song. I want to encourage you to, uh, to listen to that maybe on the way home. Uh, let's just give thanks to God that because of the good and perfect work of Jesus Christ, you and I get to share in his life and we get to share in the, those, those benefits and that joy of our master. Right? So as his power works through us and, and we manage to clumsily do a few humble things to the glory of God and, and simply for the praise of the love of him, 
Um, let's look forward to the day when we'll, we'll share in the reward that Christ earned for us. And we'll hear applied to us what only he deserved. Those same words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. For the sake of my son, you are brought in to my joy. Has he not blessed us in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we cannot even begin to understand the way your riches and your grace have been poured out to us, grace upon grace upon grace. Mercy following after mercy after following mercy. Your, your steadfast love reaches to the heavens, Lord, and beyond. Fill us, Lord. Change us. Transform us to the perfect work of your Son then and his perfect work in us now. Help us to believe and trust you and to do all things for your glory. And by your grace, Lord, may we hear you say at the end, as we are in Christ, enter into the joy of your master. Give us now something of that joy, Lord, as we, we seek to meditate on you more and praise you. We ask in Jesus' name.